Hello, Mr. Johnson. Hey, Blake from Respiratory. Is there if I come in, do a little assessment on you here? Okay, well, let me wash my hands here real quick. So, as I was saying, I'm from Respiratory. Uh, I'm going to come and do just a little assessment on you here, real quick, okay? How are you doing today? Been having any trouble with your breathing? A little sleepy, huh? Okay. Let me check your wristband here real quick. All right. Can you tell me your name and date of birth? No? A little sleepy. Okay. That's all right. So I'm going to borrow your wrist here. Uh, I'm going to check your heart rate real quick, okay? And then uh, I'm going to check your blood pressure as well and then kind of check on your oxygen here. I'm going to borrow your wrist for a good minute here first. So guys, I'm just palpating this radial artery, all right? It's important that we use these two fingers instead of a thumb. Um, your thumb, you have a pretty decent um, sized vessel in there, and sometimes you can confuse your heart rate for his. Sometimes it can be a little tricky to find, but it's going to be on the side that uh, runs along the same side as your thumb, okay? And it essentially lays between that radial tuberosity, so a big bony prominence here, and a lot of your tendons and everything that lay behind or uh, uh, in between the ulna and the radius okay so we're gonna go ahead apply firm pressure sometimes you got to roll your fingers back and forth you don't want to apply it too firm okay but you want to apply just enough and essentially what i'm going to do here is i'm going to count for just 15 seconds if it's a regular pulse okay multiply it by four uh if it was irregular i would have to count for a full minute otherwise my number would be incorrect Likewise, the longer you do count, if you count over 30 seconds and then just multiply by two, um, that's going to be the, the longer you count, the more accurate. Okay, so I'm essentially palpating. He's got big bounding pulses. So really, I, I'm feeling the, the rate, feeling for the rhythm and the strength. So that pulse pressure, which we kind of talk about uh, in regards to blood pressure and everything. Okay, so I ended up with what? 18 here so 18 times 4 essentially gives us 72 so 72 per minute which is normal that normal heart rate is 60 to 100 i can say he's got a good strong pulse and a good rhythm the fact that he wasn't able to speak to me is simply just because i don't have somebody else running the sim lab here but once again even though it's not part of this checkoff we are assessing level of consciousness okay i have a lot of uh, concerns that automatically manifest if i walk into a room and a patient is not able to respond or doesn't know what's going on make mention in the handout your person should or your patient should be able to be orientated to really person time place situation or a and o times four if somebody can not answer follow commands or wake up with some stimulation we're worried about a lot of different things whether that's drugs whether that's a cns disturbance or whether that is hypercarbia or so they're not breathing effectively and co2 builds up and it make you sleepy we're concerned about all those things and it would require a little bit further uh, investigation okay so without this patient knowing it i'm going to continue to hold his his wrist and act like i'm uh, really palpating that artery and counting heart rate but i'm going to try and kind of subtly watch him breathe okay and the same deal i'm going to try and count for 15 seconds if he's got a good regular rhythm yeah, the longer i count the better but once again we got to know how to get a decent enough and accurate enough value as well as be efficient with our time okay so i'm going to go ahead and count and breathe but i'm going to continue to hold his wrist like i'm checking his heart rate if he makes eye contact and realizes I'm watching him breathe, I'm going to try and look away. This should be unobserved. Most patients breathe faster if they know they're being watched. Okay, so over 15 seconds, I had a respiratory rate of 6. I'm going to multiply that by 4. That gives us a respiratory rate of 24. So he is tachypnic. Okay, and we would be thinking about why is he tachypnic? And that kind of stuff we'll get into in some of our other segments and everything. All right. I'm also, once again, more investigation is going to follow uh, and a more detailed assessment. We're going to be looking more at the quality of those respirations, work of breathing, chest expansion, a lot of these different things here. Okay, so Mr. Johnson, I got your heart rate and everything like that. I'm going to go ahead and check a blood pressure on you here real quick. So once again, this is not something we typically do clinically. Okay, I, I use blood pressure as I'm um, kind of assessing my patients, but I'm not actually the one performing it. You actually will not see a lot of manual blood pressures done at the hospital. Most people are doing an automated uh, Dynamap or an automatic kind of cuff where you just are hitting the start button after you put a cuff on. 
So the sphygmomanometer, you'll never hear that, call that again, blood pressure cuff. Okay, a couple of things. Here's our little uh, gauge here that's gonna allow us to measure pressure. We got our cuff itself, and then this little ball squeeze is gonna pressurize it. This is the needle valve, this little silver piece. If you turn it clockwise, it's gonna tighten, and then it'll release pressure by turning it counterclockwise, okay? We're gonna go ahead and kind of have it uh, all the way tightened or turned to the clockwise. This cuff should fit snug, snug enough on his arm, but not super tight. And we want it about an inch above that AC area, the antecubital fossa. It's that spot right here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead. Um, you can kind of get this oriented where it lines up the uh, line on here for the artery with where that patient's brachial artery is gonna be. And we'll talk about where that's gonna be, but essentially it's the medial part of the arm up above the AC, it kind of runs uh, in between that bicep and tricep, but medial on the arm, and then kind of comes to a bifurcation where it splits in your ulnar and radial arteries down past the AC area. We want this cuff about an inch above that AC, and the line, if you line that up with the cuff, it's not going to do a whole lot, but it allows you to kind of clip that uh, pressure gauge on there so you can uh, easily see it as you're doing this, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and get that about an inch above. Snug, but not too tight, and then once again, if you want to, you can clip this on sometimes, like in this case, I'm gonna just kind of set it right here, okay? And what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna palpate the brachial artery first, which, you don't notice this guy have a brachial. Very mechanical brachial. So what I'm trying to do, I got this needle bob closed, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pump up that cuff. I'm gonna continue to pump up. And I'm just focusing on that brachial pulse, okay? I'm gonna continue to pump until the brachial pulse goes away. So at the point it goes away, right now I'm at 150 millimeters of mercury. I'm gonna pump an additional 30 millimeters of mercury. And once again, just by squeezing that bulb, I'm watching the little gauge here. I'm gonna go up 30 millimeters of mercury above the point at which I lost that, and then I'm gonna use my stethoscope. Ah, don't poke yourself in the eyeball with your stethoscope. Ow. Uh, I'm gonna now put my stethoscope where my fingers were, and I found that brachial. I'm gonna slowly release pressure. And I'm, as soon as I begin to hear noise, that means that the pressure in that artery has exceeded the pressure in the cuff. You're going to hear this sound called a cardiacal sound. It's uh, blood going through that turbulent kind of uh, squeezing on that artery. You also see the needle valve start to jump. That is the point at which we hear that is going to be our systolic. I'm going to continue to release pressure until I stop hearing that noise, and you'll see that needle gauge stop bouncing, and that is where your diastolic pressure is. Not very realistic on this guy here. Okay, much more easy on a real person. My God, I think I'm blind. <laughs> Don't do that with your stethoscope. So I would go ahead, I'd document that blood pressure. And remember, we typically, that systolic, there's a couple of things that can qualify as, uh, you know, hypotension, hypertension. We look at both the systolic as well as the diastolic. The systolic should typically be greater than 90, but less than 140. There's all other sorts of degrees of pre-hypertension and stuff we don't need to be concerned with. Uh, hypotension could be that uh, that patient's uh, systolic is less than 90, all right? Or we could also look at the diastolic. So that diastolic should be greater than 60, but not at greater than uh, 90, all right? So if we are, uh, if that bottom number is above 90 millimeters of mercury, it's hypertension. If it's below 60, it's hypotension. Honestly, your body spends more time at that diastole or the spot in, or the time in between ventricular contractions. So it's usually more of a significant thing if that bottom number is a lot higher, uh, more of a taxing on your heart and you know your systemic circulation and everything like that. The other thing we look at is mean arterial pressure. We're not going to calculate it in this class, but a lot of times when you're looking at a blood pressure on an automated uh, machine on a monitor in the ICU, you'll see a number of parentheses. That's the mean or the average. It's essentially your systolic plus your diastolic times two, all that divided by three. Mean arterial pressure is probably the most important in regards to perfusing the vital organs of the body. And typically, uh, a MAP less than 65 is considered hypotension. A MAP less than 60, we're worried about having adequate perfusion to your kidneys to filter blood and your other vital organs and such. 
okay? So very, very important. Once again, we don't typically measure blood pressure, but it's something we use as part of a routine assessment. We'll talk about how that impacts you know, oxygenation and everything in some of our later courses. So I did respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, checked his LOC. I wouldn't be talking to a group of people about him here, obviously, like I am right now. The last thing is something we actually would not be doing, probably, uh, if we had just done a manual heart rate. We're going to I get a little portable pulse oximeter. Okay, get a little finger probe, and essentially that shines your two wavelengths of light. Got an infrared and then a red light, and then uh, really they're LEDs, and then it's got a detector on the back side. So these ones shine light through, and then it's got a uh, sensor that's picking up on how much that uh, wavelength of light travels through that capillary bed. Some of them you'll see forehead probes where the uh, you know the light source and the uh, sensor are on the same size, so you can get away with. Uh, you know, actually measuring that, it does need to be a designated uh, sensor that's meant to work that way, not just a disposable finger probe. All I'm going to do on this one, I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to pick a finger, all right, slide this on. This guy doesn't really have a heart rate, but what it's going to do is going to pick up on the little pulse of how changes of blood going through that capillary bed, and ultimately it's going to give me a heart rate and beats per minute, and it's going to give me an SpO2 percentage, okay? And we said SpO2 is, is ultimately, or I didn't say it, it's on the handout. It's honestly a non-invasive measure of the amount of carrying capacity of the hemoglobin that is filled, okay? So typically, clinically, we'd like to see that greater than 90%. Sometimes we'll have more specific guidelines, and we'll tie that into oxygen administration. Um, pulse oximetry is probably more realistic of something that you're going to do rather than just do a manual pressure or manual uh, palpation of a heart rate, but you need to be able to do both. But if we had a pulse oximeter, I probably wouldn't manually verify that heart rate unless I had some questions about it or anything. Uh, some of the limitations with this are, once again, it's telling us that the pulse, you know, the uh, red blood cells or, or the hemoglobin are saturated with something. We're assuming that's oxygen, but it could be carbon monoxide, it could be methemoglobinemia. If he doesn't have good perfusion right here, I'm not going to be able to get an accurate waveform. As we get into more advanced uh, pulse oximetry, some of the nicer machines that give you what's called a pleth, or it gives you a waveform and shows you that blood flow going through that vessel. All right, and typically we want to uh, correlate our findings with seeing a good pleth or good waveform to try and say that that value is valid or not, okay? So um, sometimes as we get into oxygen therapy, once again, we'll have more specific stuff, but generally speaking, 90% or greater. And then we would take into consideration how much oxygen he was on in order to get that. All right, so sorry to keep breaking characters. Sorry, I almost blinded myself in the middle of all this here. So when you guys do your checkoff, you'll be doing this with your PPE as well. Um, on the blood pressure, we'll see. It wasn't very accurate doing it on him, so I'll probably make you do that on Danielle or myself, okay? But uh, we'll get plenty of practice. All the other aspects of the uh, assessment are very easy to do in here. And we can actually share, we'll have the heart rate and respiratory rate on the monitor, but we'll cover it up, and then that way you can kind of check and make sure you're on the right track and everything. But we'll practice on your classmates, we'll practice on the mannequin here. And then we'll kind of conclude with, you know, you never just want to go, bye, all right? You're going to say, all right, thank you. I'm going to get you covered back up here. Anything I can get for you here right now? Okay, well, uh, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to chart some stuff here, and uh, you let us know if you need anything. We go ahead, and then once again, you guys be taking off your PPE and appropriate uh, sequence and everything. I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to get rid of my gloves and ASAP the commander by folding it inside out, throw them away into a trash can. I go ahead and wash my hands and go on and see them in the next one. So I hope this little video helps. Video kind of short and sweet, it'll be better as we get into some more media equipment stuff and everything like that. Um, but this is just meant as a supplement for you visual learners, I guess, uh, to kind of bring everything to life. But please take a look at those handouts and they'll help kind of explain some of this stuff. I'll see you guys a little bit later this week. Hopefully I can see out of my right eye and I'm not wearing a patch. All right. Bye, guys.